I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. Today is a game show review day. Math Dad loves competition, and so he has turned this into a Science Kids versus Math Dad event. And I think we all know who's going to win, right? So what are you wearing? So I'm totally <laughs> team unbeatable Science Kids, and I know they're going to get every question right. And in fact, on page 28 and 29 of our notes, we have a practice quiz to help you get ready so that you can defeat Math Dad. Yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. The, your, the defeat is inevitable, but give it a good try, kids. <laughs> Welcome! We are here with Science Puppy and our students ready to go live for our first quiz show. Before we get started, I want to wish a very happy birthday to Lucas, Luca, who turns 10 today, and to Ruth Anna, who turns 11. Happy birthday, you guys. Indeed. And a special welcome to Owen and Ciara and watching in Ottawa and so many more who are joining us live today. Welcome to you if you're watching the replay. So I'm going to say we go through a lot of poll questions in this class and I don't think it's that hard to get the poll questions right on the day when we go over to the topic because we just barely talked about it and reviewed the answers. But today it's a review day where we're going to ask questions about topics that were covered earlier this week or last week or the week before. And so those are gonna be much harder questions. We're going to see how well you've learned this material. And some of these are gonna be tricky questions. Math Dad is totally planning on stumping you, but I know you guys are undefeatable science kids. Really quick <laughs> plug, if anyone wants to get a t-shirt, there is the link to our store. I'll throw it in the chat as well and put it in the description. And now without further ado, let's get started. We have 20 questions. And as always, you can go to itempool.com slash science mom slash live to vote live. And if that link doesn't work for you and you're not able to vote, vote live, there is always the option of just saying it out loud. If you say it out loud, you will learn more and remember better. That's true. All right, for our very first question, what gas accounts for 1% of our atmosphere? Can we show this? We can either show no, we, we, well, we can either show the question or we can show... Let, let's show this and then we can All go right. back once the All votes right. are coming in. We don't need to see the votes the whole time. So when you're looking at the gases of the atmosphere, most of them are going to be this, whatever this is. Then we have quite a bit of this gas. But 1% is this right here. The, what is that 1%? Kind of orange color? Yes. What is that 1%? Okay. So our options include the oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, nitrogen, methane. Which gas accounts for just 1% of the atmosphere? I'd say just 1%, but it's actually the third most common, right? It is the third most common. It definitely is. All right. All right. So I'm going to finish and reveal. Dun, 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 dun. They got it correct. Oh, Good job, you guys. The did. answer is argon. Argon is by is that 1%. And then nitrogen is the most common gas in our atmosphere, and oxygen is next. All of the others are less than 1%. So if we go back to our little drawing, everything else, carbon dioxide, methane, that's this tiny little less than 1% right there. But here we have nitrogen and oxygen. Whoops, and that's not nearly as big as I thought it was going to be and kind of hard to see. Apologies. Yeah, but I, I've i got to say, though, it, it is pretty cool that... Uh, it's such a small portion of the gases are those greenhouse gases, that, but, but they, they can make have a big such difference. a yeah. huge impact. Yeah, they do. All right. Next question. All right. These next three questions are really fun ones. We've got some clues for you and you have to figure out which layer of the atmosphere we're talking about. All right. So in this case, we have the temperature is negative 15 degrees Celsius. So a bit below freezing, but not super below freezing. So the air pressure is very low. So human beings could not breathe this air. And there is a lot of solar radiation, but the air particles are not charged. Mm. So which one could this be? Can we do the picture in picture? Maybe. Maybe not. Nope. Nope. Wrong okay. Button. Never no. mind. That's just me hitting the wrong button. There we go. Which layer of the atmosphere are, are we in if we have these clues? So our, there's radiation, but the air particles are not charged. We can't breathe this air and survive. It's too thin. And the temperature is relatively warm. Mm. 
Well, so I don't know. Is negative 15 degrees warm? Five I, degrees for you? I, I suppose this is kind of warm considering you're way up high in the atmosphere. Yeah. It, 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 this is not the coldest. That's that's for sure. But you would hey, definitely. What are you? Are you eating my hoodie? Well, he was. He was trying to chew on your jacket. All right. Well, one of these two was just chewing on my my shoulder. I'm not, not sure which one it was. I wasn't watching, but it was the puppy. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is it's a tough one. And they voted for. Oh, but it was close. The stratosphere. And the stratosphere is correct. Ah, they got it right. I was so close to stumping them, science mom. The next answer was mesosphere, and mesosphere is a very good second guess. Because in the mesosphere, we also cannot breathe the air. It's too thin. Our clue here with negative 15 degrees Celsius, our clue is that the air is kind of warm. C compared to the mesosphere, which is actually where you get the coldest layer of the atmosphere. So the temperatures were kind of rising throughout the stratosphere as you climbed higher. When you hit the mesosphere, temperatures start dropping. They get a and lot colder. So it's, it's the, the mesosphere is the coldest layer yep. of the atmosphere. But yeah, kudos to you. Good it, job, you guys. I honestly was not as confident on my answer here. Um, the, the temperature gave it away, but the the other clues maybe not quite as much. This was a really tricky question. You guys did really well. All right, all right. They got that one. Next question is another one of these sort of mystery clues that are a little bit more challenging, but we have different clues this time. Okay. So here, our temperature is negative 32 degrees, so colder than before, but the air is low enough, the pressure is low enough that human beings could survive for a few hours, and there are clouds. So what layer of the atmosphere are we in now? So the pressure is high enough that human beings can survive. Okay. And there are clouds. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't say to accept answers. So that they're trying to vote and they can't because I didn't really open the question. All right, which is it? The troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere? Exosphere, thermosphere. thermosphere yeah. If the air, pre te air temperature is negative 32 degrees Celsius, and human beings could survive here for a couple hours. So, and when you're naming the temperature, you're just naming some location? Or yes, maybe so some for, for each of these, I picked an elevation and then I researched what would the temperature air pressure be and what huh. would some things be. And so this is why they're tricky because there isn't just one temperature for a whole entire layer right. and I'm just picking somewhere in the layer. Gotcha. So these are extra tricky questions. All right. And they said the troposphere. Troposphere is correct. That's right. So the, the giveaway on this one is that we could live there. But I also also the clouds are there. The weather is there. It's yeah. the bottom layer. But we the biggest... live in the troposphere, bottom of the atmosphere. All this weather happens here in, in the, the troposphere. troposphere. And the real clue is that we can breathe. If you can breathe the air, it has to be in the troposphere. This clue was actually taken from the top of Mount Everest. I looked up what the weather conditions were on Everest on the day that I wrote this, and the temperature was negative 32 degrees Celsius, which is pretty darn cold. Yes, it is. Right. Okay, the next question. Once again, which layer of the atmosphere is described by these clues? The air pressure is extremely low. We could not breathe this air at all. Okay. The air particles are receiving so much radiation that they are charged or ionized. And the temperature is getting warmer the higher we go up. Mm -hmm. Which layer is this? Watching the votes come in. I don't know if they're going to get this one. Oh, I think they're going to get this one. And I will, can I? Will no, I? no. You okay, can't. I can't give a hint. No yeah. hints. I mean, they, they need all the help they can get, Science Mom, but I, I don't want it to go to their heads if they get it right. Science Puppy says hello. He believes in you. He knows that you can learn these layers. <laughs> all right. All right, we're going to reveal the answer here. They said the thermosphere. And the thermosphere is correct. And our big clue here is that our particles are charged. Particles in the thermosphere are charged and the temperature is getting much hotter as we go up. If you measure temperature based on how fast those particles are moving. But remember, they're so spread apart that we would not feel warm in the thermosphere. No, but the thermo th temperature. Thermo, that's yeah, where it comes yeah. from. Yep. Makes sense. Nicely done, you guys. Okay. 
Next question is, where do the satellites orbit? Where do the satellites orbit? What layer? So here's a picture of a satellite. And I have to say, satellites are pretty amazing pieces of machinery. And a lot we get a lot of information from them, and they orbit for a long time. This mm. is a fairly newer model of a satellite orbiting around the Earth, and it's in one of the layers of the atmosphere. But which layer is it? The troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere. And even if you're ha still having trouble telling them apart and, and, and just don't feel as confident, I mean, make sure you, you try to memorize the order. I, I like to go from bottom to top. So that we can say, yeah, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere. And yeah, that, that would be the, the first thing to get down. All right, the answer that they said is the exosphere. And that is 100% correct. Very nicely done. All exosphere right. is where our satellites are, and then the thermosphere is where our International Space Station is. Good job. All right, they're, they're doing pretty well, science mom. But okay, those, those are kind of like warm-up questions. Undefeated. They're, oh, man. Unbeatable. <laughs> All right. All right, let's show a picture for our next one. Ooh. This is a true-false statement. So the only difference between fog and a stratus cloud is their location. They are made of exactly the same thing, water droplets. Is that true? So here you can see a picture of two people walking through fog on a foggy day. Is that the same thing as a cloud? Hmm. 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 So I do see one bar getting most of the votes. Which means your defeat is inevitable, my <laughs> dad. It just means they're, they're missing so, so many of them. It's just kind of sad that they're missing us. <laughs> I feel sorry for them. All right, let's reveal the answer. Science mom Krista has a great comment. If you get a question wrong, sometimes that helps you learn even better because then ooh. you'll think like, ooh, I didn't get it right, and that might help you learn. So if you get questions wrong, that is not, despite all the trash tacking that Math Dad does, <laughs> that is not a bad thing because you are learning. And science kids got this one right. They did. So it, the only difference is the elevation, right? Yes. And let's head back to this picture real fast. Now, a low-level stratus cloud is going to be made out of the exact same thing as fog, little water droplets. But if we take this same cloud and we move it way up high in the atmosphere to where it's a lot colder, then those water droplets will freeze into little ice crystals. So high stratus clouds, those are ice crystals. But low-level stratus clouds, those are made of water droplets. Yeah. Oh, super cool. Next question. A cloud that produces lightning Ooh. is called a... Is it a stratus cloud, cumulonimbus cloud, cirrus cloud, cumulus cloud? What do we call a cloud that produces lightning? And it turns out that only one type of cloud really produces lightning. Yeah. They're my favorite cloud, by the way. Partly because I love the name and partly because I just think thunder clouds are really cool. They're pretty cool. I mean, to be able to hold that much water, that's, that's a, a big deal. Yeah. All right. We are going to reveal the answer. Cumulonimbus is correct. Nicely done, you guys. A cumulonimbus cloud is a large, huge cloud that has enough mass and enough charge with how particles are moving that it can produce lightning. And lightning can be from cloud to cloud or from cloud to ground. So sometimes when you hear thunder, Ooh. it's not lightning going to the ground. Sometimes it could be lightning going to another cloud. I hadn't thought of that. That's kind of cool, huh? Th that is really interesting. And I agree with you. It's a pretty cool name, Cumulonimbus. All right. Question number eight. Cold air moving over a lake can cause an increase in rain or snow. Oh. Is that true or false? So here's a large lake, and if we have wind moving over that lake, and that wind is colder than the water, will that cause there to be more precipitation? Mm. This is a fact that we're stating here, and it is either true or it is false, and you need to tell us which you think it is. Mm. And our answers are almost Pretty close. tied. Oh, now one of them's breaking ahead. One of them's going to oh, be the it's winner. Gaining. It's gaining. Oh, no, it's not gaining. I <laughs> So much suspense. Go back to the Oh, oh. Okay, show the right camera. We definitely have a winner. Go ahead and finish and reveal. They said it's true. 
Uh, wait, did I? True is correct. True is the correct answer. They said false. Oh, <gasps> Math Dad, you did it. You stumped them. Oh, it was, it was only a matter of time. <laughs> he feels so proud. Let's look at this picture again and talk about the lake effect because this is what this is called the lake effect. And any time that you have a large lake or body of water in the wintertime, especially if the air is colder than the lake, then this cold air coming over the water picks up a lot of water vapor. And then since it's colder than the water, that water vapor condenses into droplets and you either get rain or snow. And in the Midwest, especially by the Great Lakes, they talk about this a lot when they talk about weather forecasts, because if you have a big mass of air coming down from Canada that's really cold, you can actually sometimes see mm. clouds that look almost exactly like the outline of the lakes as all of that water vapor condenses, oh. and then it will dump right on top of Michigan. And did you say it was because the temperature was colder in the air than the water? Yes. So if the air temperature is colder than the water, then you can get massive amounts of snow. Cool. Yeah, so I've definitely heard about the lake effect snow, but I don't know that I really understood it very well before. Yeah, this is lake effect snow. And Math Dad and I grew up close to Utah and in Utah, and they talked about that quite a bit because the Great Salt Lake, sometimes you would get snowstorms that then would put a lot of snow in the mountains, and people in Utah are very proud of their snow that is good for skiing <laughs> because of the Great Salt Lake. Oh, that's true. All right, so that was the first of many victories to come for I Math think, Dad. I think that's the only one. <laughs> Our next one is a fun question that you get to just pick whichever one you would prefer. So would you rather spend one day on the International Space Station, spend one day in a deep sea submersible, or spend one day at the South Pole Research Station? So mm. these are some really fun choices here. You get to pick. You have one day where you, sunrise to sunset, you could be doing research on the space station, floating weightless in space, you could be in a deep sea submersible exploring hydrothermal vents underneath the ocean, which I have to say would be pretty awesome. Agreed. You might see a giant squid. Or you could spend one day at the South Pole, which literally does have a striped pole just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do awesome research in Antarctica. So I noticed that that South Pole has a shadow. Is there ever a time when the South Pole doesn't have a shadow in daylight? No. Because the sun's always going to yeah, be the, the sun at is, an angle. The sun is never directly above the South Pole. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. All right, I, I see that the votes are in, and there's definitely one category that has the, the bulk you, of the votes. What do you think it is? Close your eyes, Math Dad. I'm, I'm guessing they said space station, because being weightless would be awesome. And that's being, what they said. Being in the space station would be super awesome. I, I'd, I'd probably have to go for space station myself. Although, not that the other ones aren't pretty tempting, but... It would be hard to pass up that opportunity. Only one of these, though, if you're going from sunrise to sunset, only one of these is going to be 24 hours. Well... <laughs> because if you're in the South Pole Research Station from sunrise to sunset, that means you'll be there for six months. Oh, my goodness. And if you're on the <laughs> International Space Station from sunrise to sunset, I think that's going to be about 10 hours. One of the science I, moms want to fact check that for me. I didn't oh, have I, time to look it up. I thought that the International Space Station went around the or, Earth a lot faster than that. But uh, well, that was like every 90 minutes or so. But, but okay, <laughs> you, that's a good point. Sunrise to sunset would be different depending on which of those locations yeah. you were at. So if a magic genie ever offered you the chance to spend one day on each of these things, you should definitely clarify, are we talking sunrise to sunset or 24 hours? Because this is an important <laughs> distinction. <laughs> Indeed. All right, next question. All right. Which of these is the main cause of wind? You've got sky giants sneezing, air moving from high pressure area to low pressure area, or air moving from low pressure areas to high pressure areas. <gasps> and there was supposed to be one more option as well, animals and things on the earth moving. So you may have heard of the butterfly effect, like a butterfly flaps its <laughs> wings, and then that movement causes air molecules to move, and they cause other molecules to move. Spoiler alert, butterfly effect's not correct. It is not correct. It didn't even make it on as one of the options. <laughs> mm. I think the sky giants are going to win this poll. I, I, I just sense it in my bones. I don't think so. No? Nope. And science puppy's totally asleep. Or he was until I picked him up. All right. The, the vast majority are picking one particular category. All right, but let's are they find getting out. it right? 
and oops. No, no, they said no. it's air moving from a high pressure area to low pressure areas. Correct. Nicely done. Nicely done. That, that, that makes sense. If the pressure is higher, it's going to push everything around it towards the, the lower pressure area. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, is that the same effect like with the balloon? It is. It is. And if you ever have this come up and you can't remember, is it from high pressure to low or is it from low pressure to high? Just think about a balloon. If you have a balloon that is full of air, it's that high pressure inside that is keeping the balloon inflated. And if you let go, all of the air rushes out of the balloon. That's right. Nicely done. Okay, okay. they got that one right. Not, not bad, not bad. Ooh, but they're not getting this one. Oh, I bet they will. Which of the following are greenhouse gases? Select all of that apply. And I mean, they could guess a few of these, right, Science Mom? So I, I think it, it should be clear, let's clarify, that I'm the winner unless all of the correct answers are above all of the incorrect answers. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay, okay, just. <laughs> so don't, don't just pick all six, pick which ones you think are greenhouse gases. Here we have carbon dioxide, we have argon, we have oxygen, we have methane, we have water vapor, and we have nitrogen. Which ones out of these gases will trap heat and keep heat in the planet? Ooh, it's a mystery. And we definitely have three winners, Math Dad. Look at that. I, I see. It's like it's like two, you're going to jail. There are bars two, coming across. Yeah, there's, there's pokey bars too. It's get, get me right in the side of the head. Um, <laughs> yeah, so two of them got a lot of votes, and a third one's getting some votes, and three are getting fewer votes. Okay, I'm, I'm definitely seeing a difference here. All right. Let's go ahead, finish and reveal. And so we got carbon Whoa. dioxide, water vapor, and methane. In totally 100% correct. Nicely done, you guys. These are the greenhouse gases. Nitrogen, oxygen, and argon are not greenhouse gases. Good nope. job. And those are the more common ones, too. The, the, yes. the most common ones are not greenhouse gases. And that's fortunate for us, because otherwise, Earth would be a lot hotter, because the, the heat would if, get trapped in. Yes, if our atmosphere were mostly carbon dioxide, that would be really bad. We'd be like Venus. Super, super, super hot. All right. Question 12. Which part of the atmosphere contains the ozone layer? And we'll be talking about the ozone layer a lot more in a couple weeks. And it is important mm. to know where it is. Is it in the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, or the exosphere? Where is it? It's one of those layers. It is one of those layers. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't think this one's fooling too many, unfortunately. This must have been too easy. Ooh, and one of my science moms came through and found out, did some research to see how long sunrise to sunset is for an astronaut on the space station. Space, space station. Space. It's pretty short. They see 15 to 16 sunrises every day. So let's do the math real quick, math dad. If they see, let's say they see 15, 15 sunrises every day, then how long is a day for someone on the space station? 24 hours divided by 15. Oh man, so. Yeah, so I guess it's more than 90 minutes, but I don't know, 100 minutes or so. So just um, just about an hour and a half. Yeah. So your time on the space station, about an hour and a half if it was sunrise to sunset. But boy, you'd have a lot of fun floating around in outer space for that hour and a half. Yes, indeed. Sign me up. All right. And they, they say the stratosphere. Correct. They, you guys know what you're talking about when it comes to the ozone layer. Awesome. Next question. Ooh, so th this one is our mystery. And for today, instead of giving Math Dad the where in the world mystery, we're going to give it to you guys and see if you can guess. Mm. So an eruption buried this city under several meters of ash, forgotten for 1,500 years. It's one of the world's largest digs. So what buried city are we talking about here? <laughs> I just have to tell you, Math Dad, there's some great little jokes in the chat. Coaster Cody says, we lured Math Dad into a false sense of security. Oh, no. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm watching the votes come in. Yeah. What, what is our answer here? And, the, and if you've been following along on page 30 of the notes, we only have two remaining where in the world mysteries that we haven't talked about yet. So this is one of them. The picture is pretty recognizable. But what was it? Was it Tambora, Krakatoa, Pompeii, Mount St. Helens? Let's finish and reveal. And the answer was 
Pompeii. Pompeii. Pompeii is correct. This is one of the I, I, most. I'm really famous. impressed that they, everybody got that because I don't think it was that that easy of a question. No, this was this is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world, and it's amazing because you had an entire city. This is in Italy, not too far away from Rome, um, kind of near the coast. You had an entire city that, in a matter of hours, was completely buried in ash, and a lot of the buildings, like the tops of the buildings, were destroyed, but certain areas were really well preserved. It's an amazing archeological site. So good, good job on that one. Those where in the world clues are, are not easy. All right, question 14. When the speed of an air current increases, what happens to the pressure? So something is going to happen to the pressure. Anytime you have air moving faster, the pressure is either, is it gonna drop or is it gonna rise? That's what we need to know. So we talked about this a bit on Friday when we talked about the Bernoulli principle, and I've got my fingers crossed hoping you remember what it is, what happens when air moves fast. It's one of two things, either the pressure rises or the pressure drops. I've narrowed, it, I've narrowed it down for you. You guys take it from there. Which one, which one is it? And, oh man, can we go back to a bigger view just to show off science puppy? Look at how sleepy he is, you guys. Oh. He's just totally asleep in my arms oh, is, until I started talking. Then he's eyes this is a limp little puppy. Oh. So if I lift up his paw and then let go, <laughs> it just falls right down. It's like a stuffed animal here. All right. It was pretty close for a second there, but suddenly one of the answers has pulled ahead, science mom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right. go back so, out. Science daughter there is, is she, that. Antagonizing the public. She, she came into the room and dressed up really funny with like she stuffed blankets under her shirt and had a blanket over her head. And I think he didn't recognize her and he was like, What is this strange person coming into my room? All right. Answer that they came up with that the is that the, the pressure drops. Correct. Nicely job done, you guys. That's the Bernoulli principle. Anytime air is moving faster, the pressure is going to drop, and that low pressure will, you know, kind of act like suction. It will pull other areas in. That's, and you that's can the same as saying that the outside air is pushing it in. It is the same. It is the same. So if you have a low pressure area, that high pressure that's all around it is going to push in, or you can think of it as sucking in kind of the same thing. So that nicely done. So that's what keeps airplanes in the air, right? We, it, we mm -hmm. said that the air over the top of the wing was moving faster. So there was lower pressure and that was higher pressure underneath. That's one yeah. of the main, one of the main things that helps airplanes fly. Okay. This one, I'm not sure if they'll remember because th these are not very common names. What is the name of the large belt of air currents that circulate between the equator and 30 degrees of latitude? So it's a little hard to see. I should have changed it to white text, but here's 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees would be up at the pole. Here's the equator. And we have two big belts of air that circulate from the equator up to 30 degrees and then drop back in. And they just keep going around and around and around. Mm. What are those called? The Hadley cells, the feral cells, or the polar cells? We have another big bar that is about to hit you in the head, Math Dad. That means your defeat is inevitable. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe they'll get it right. The victory goes to the science kids. <laughs> uh, pride cometh before the fall. <laughs> All right, I'm going to reveal the answer. The Hadley cells, they got they got it right. That is correct. So there were th th three different types of, of cells. This name, the Hadley cells, were near the equator. Yes. And show this picture again. Yeah. I'll, I'll draw them. And here we have the polar cells that are between 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Uh, you had what? Sorry. Ha did I say? You said polar. I, I meant to say feral. Feral cells are here. No, no. Your arrow is the wrong way. It, and then the polar cells are here. <laughs> the arrow is the right way. They go like this. I drew it wrong in the notes by accident. Though. No, no, you've drawn it wrong here. It's, the, the arrows have to match up. Don't. <laughs> so, science mom, it's got to go like this and like this. Am I wrong? We will talk about <gasps> it. We'll talk about it later. All right. I'm, I, <laughs> I might be confused. All right. All right. Should know better than to correct science mom. Our next question. What happens in very humid air if the temperature drops? Ooh. If the air is very humid, it's holding a lot of water. And if the temperature drops, we should add if it drops below the dew point. Mm -hmm. That's an important clarification. If it drops that low, what is going to happen? Are we going to have 
condensation, evaporation, precipitation, sublimation. Mm. Evaporation, condensation. I think, ba -bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I think I see a flaw in my question here. We'll see. We'll, let's, let's see how it comes out. All right. So very humid air. The temperature drops. What will the outcome be? I'm going to finish and reveal. Condensation is an excellent answer. So is precipitation. Those two answers, I'm going to say, are both correct. So I, sh I should have let them select more than one answer on this one. So Because, yeah, it all depends. Dew forming is also a correct answer. So I'm going to say victory to the science kids on this one. D because... d d definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. There were two correct answers, and I didn't let you select them both, but you clearly did select both awesome. A and C. Those are correct answers. What was what was the did you think was the problem with that question? Oh, that I didn't let them select more than one answer. Oh, okay. All right. Which of these are necessary for tornadoes to form? Ooh. Ooh, and for this one, I have a little video just for fun. So here is a tornado. Oh. Tornadoes oh, are in can be incredibly destructive, super powerful rotating vortexes of air. And what things do you have to have for them to form? So we're at high wind shear, long dry spells updrafts of air, warm ocean waters, or high moisture in the air. You can mark more than one. Which of those help tornadoes to form? Mm. And not just help, but are, are required. You won't, wouldn't get a tornado. You won't get a tornado without, without. certain ingredients. Which mm. ingredients do you need? Ingredients. That's an interesting term for that. Yep. In case you were going to bake up a tornado <laughs> later. Don't bake up a tornado. <laughs> nope. Ooh, okay, so I'm seeing Ooh, and three that are very close. A good comment about tornadoes that, that came up um, by email that someone sent me was that another reason that you cannot see, cannot always see a tornado is because a tornado could happen at night. So we, That's we tend a to, really good point. We tend to think of tornadoes only happening during the day, but one could happen at night. My guess is they occur at night fairly often. Yeah. All right. Finish and reveal. Hadn't really thought about that. All right, they said high wind shear, updrafts of air, and high moisture in the air. And that is correct. You definitely need those things. And the updrafts of air, that's what you get when you have instability in the air. So when you have some dry, cold air meeting warm, moist air, you get that instability. Gotcha. The shear was when you had winds traveling at different speeds at different heights. Different directions, yes. Different, different, different directions, yeah. And then our moist air, you have to have a lot of moisture. That's just something that you need for tornadoes. Ooh, here's a good one. So what causes cyclones north of the equator to rotate counterclockwise and in the south of the equator to rotate clockwise? So here I've got two pictures. You can see that this cyclone, and cyclone is the scientific term, but we tend to call these, if they're in the Atlantic Ocean, we call them hurricanes. And if they're in the Pacific Ocean, we tend to call them typhoons. Both of these are cyclones. But north of the equator, this cyclone is going nope, to, nope, oh, nope. I, I drew it wrong. Yep, this way. Th Thank you, Math Dad. This time I know I got it right. And then. And then south of the equator, it's going to rotate the other direction. So what is causing that? That is our question for you. Is it the Coriolis effect? Is it caused by magnetism, the magnetic fields of the earth? Is it caused by solar winds or marmosets? Marmosets, <laughs> marmosets are pretty powerful, sneaky, cute little animals. Can't rule it out. Can't, can't rule it out. All right. Looks like most of the votes are in. And the Coriolis effect is correct. Yes. So, so when this is what we demonstrated when we had Math Dad try to draw a line across a surface that was spinning. And if the surface is spinning and you try and draw a straight line, your straight line is going to curve. And that is the Coriolis effect. And so, so you, let, me, let me pull up the globe real quick. The... As the Earth is spinning, then part of it is moving faster than other parts. So if you were to look up where my fingers are at the poles, the Earth's not moving very much at all. The poles are actually staying exactly still. But around the equator, that part's moving the fastest. So that's causing the, the wind, the air there, to move a little bit faster. And it's essentially... You know, giving a little bit of spin 
in, in a way that's causing them to spin differently depending on whether they're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Our next question is about cyclones. The largest cyclone on record was almost half the size of the U continental United States. Is that true or false? And as an image here, just for scale, here is a tropical cyclone hitting the coast of Australia. Whoop. You can see that's a lot smaller than the United States. Is it true that the largest cyclone ever recorded was about that big? About mm. half the size of the United States. That's kind of, kind of crazy to think about. That's enormous. Although I've got to say, for scale, th these are not to the same scale. So, no, no, they're not sorry. to the scale at all. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to trick you. I just wanted to sort of show just how large that is for something to be, you know, a thousand miles in diameter. That's pretty big. And uh, I will observe here that it looks like really close. Is it true or is it false? We're kind of torn on this one. Almost tied. Yeah, so the largest cyclone on record. Could it be that big? As big as almost half of continental United States. What do you think, science puppy? Let's reveal the answer. True, true. is correct. Oh, I almost stumped them. But you did not. And take a look at this picture that I have. This is Hurricane Irene taken in, I believe it was 2003 from the International Space Station. It's so large. You can actually see the curvature of the Earth here in, in, this, <laughs> in this picture. So most, like the average size tropical cyclone is going to be a couple hundred miles in diameter. That's enormous. So these are enormous storm systems. And the wow. largest one that's ever been recorded really was almost a thousand miles in diameter. It was huge mind-bogglingly huge wow Ooh, i like this question so this is the idea of from where on earth can you travel one kilometer south one kilometer east then one kilometer north and be back where you started you have to be back in the same position where can that happen on earth mm. and yeah geometrically this sounds like quite the conundrum like what so you go down, then over, then up. Can you be back where you started? And your choices mm. are South Pole, North Pole, the equator, or at 30 degrees north latitude. So where is this possible? It is an interesting conundrum. Kind of crazy to, to even think about. And science puppy is ready to go to sleep again. Yeah. Yep. He's kaput. It's uh, exhausting to sit here and do all these questions, right? <laughs> right, Kaladin? He did have a nice nice long walk this morning and then chased his ball and ran around like crazy. So <laughs> he's ready for a nap. All right. Ooh, we got two very close. <gasps> Ooh. I right. stumped them, science mom. <laughs> He's so he's so proud. Let's explain this one. Maybe come come back to this paper and draw a little bit. Oh, or the ball. Yeah, let, let's let's just display the ball. Yeah, you can. Okay. So what's happening here? Besides my ball getting a little bit flat, at the North Pole, if I'm I'm, I'm going to go more than one kilometer, but if I go down a ways, and then I went east a ways, the same direct, same distance, east, and then north. <gasps> I would be back at the North Pole, and that's because the direction that was north, remember how we talked about uh, orange slices and th the way that lines of longitude work? We're, we're basically going down one side of an orange slice over to the other side of the orange slice, but then back up to the top. North um, yeah, is a, a direction where if, if wherever you are on Earth, if we all point north, they will will intersect right at the North Pole. But if we all point to the east, we are drawing parallel lines along the, the Earth's surface. And as we point east, unless we're at the same latitude, our, the lines we're drawing as we point to the east are not going to intersect. They just keep going around the Earth like the lines of, of latitude do. They do not meet at a point. So the equator doesn't work. The South Pole doesn't work because you can't even go south from the South Pole. You're as far south as you can get. Now, a really fun fact for you here. It turns out there are other places on the globe where you can do this. So as you get close to the South Pole, there's a location. Let me switch. 
there, there's a location as you approach the South Pole where if you went, you'd go south a mile, you would go east a mile, and you would go exactly once around and then be back where you were and go north. So that there's this whole circle as you start approaching the South Pole that would also satisfy this requirement. And below that, there's a place where you would go down a mile around twice and then back up. And yeah, so you get a bunch of little circles as you approach you know, one over pi kilometers from the South Pole. A couple of people asked, why doesn't it work from the South Pole? And it's just because you can't go south from the South Pole. You're as south as you can get. It's true. So you can travel north from the South Pole, but you can't travel south because you're at the South Pole. In fact, let's see. So from the South Pole, no matter which direction you step, you're headed north. You're headed north. Yep. yep. And same thing from the North Pole, no matter which direction you decide to take off, you're going south. Although, kind of, kind of a cool thing to think about. Yeah, it really is. Um, we had just a couple questions I want to answer real fast. Um, one is from Delana. What if you drew a curved line? So if let's try this math, Dad. Here's uh -huh. here's a marker for you. I'm gonna spin the plate just like this. And what happens if you try drawing a curved line? Will it end up being straight? Boy, so there's so lots gonna, of different curves I could do here. Start here and try drawing a curve to there. So from the top to here? From the top to there. Yep. All right, I'm gonna try it. All right. And that he tried drawing a curve just like this one. It ended up being a lot more straight. So we were able, we were able to compensate. So if, if I got the speed just right, it would we be could straight. probably do a straight line. Yeah. yeah that's so good. Good question there. <laughs> I, I like that. And then um, another question I see from Yana is, what would happen if the Earth spun faster? This mm. is a great question. This is actually one to answer it fully. I would like to do a little bit of research. So in the email that I send out today that is going to have the links for next week, I will research what would happen if the Earth spun faster, and I'll put it in the email. Yeah, I could, I could speculate a little bit, but... I, I, I want to research yeah. this. This is a good question. Yeah, we, we really appreciate the questions that you guys ask, because it shows that you're thinking about this deeply, and we learn a lot when... When, when you answer ask a question that we don't know the answer to, that, that's an opportunity for learning. And Definitely. I hope that you guys enjoyed this quiz show and fantastic job on doing this. And I think, Math Dad, you're trying to get out of doing the victory oh, dance. Oh, you remembered. I Ugh. did. I did. I remembered because several people in the chat were asking, what about the victory <laughs> dance? So real fast, victory dance to the science kids. And from a special request that came to our inbox, it's going to end with a dab. All right, here it goes. Here you go. The chicken floss. Good job to the undefeatable science kids. You got almost all the questions <laughs> correct. <laughs> Bravo, Matt. All right. They, they got lucky this time. You may have won the battle, but you haven't won the war. <laughs> but really, we're all winning because we are learning new things, whether you got most of the questions correct or not. But I'm going to learn are, the most. <laughs> you are learning more about planet Earth, and that's a wonderful thing. And we don't we don't need to be competitive about everything, but it does make this rather fun. I'm the least competitive there is. <laughs> <laughs> Work hard, grow smart, and we will see you next week.